Uh, welcome you all to our uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, today's topic is a very relevant topic for every one of us. It's about taking decisions, decision making. All of us uh, are required to take decisions in life, various aspects of our life, personal life, uh, uh, professional life, uh, social life. All of us take decisions and uh, sometimes we make wrong decisions. As we depend upon God, we will take the right decision. And it's important for us to understand that uh, each one of us needs to listen, depend upon God to be able to take the right decisions in life. Every aspect of life, spiritual life, home life, social life, professional life. And nobody can say that doesn't take decisions. We are all taking decisions and sometimes make mistakes. Now, when we depend upon God, uh, we will not make mistakes. Because according to Hannah in 1 Samuel 2 9, it says, uh, she says, uh, by the Holy Spirit, obviously, it's in the Bible, He guards the feet of His saints. God guards the feet of His saints. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 21, the Lord says, We turn right or left, you hear a voice saying, This is the way, walk in it. So God will reveal to us uh, His will for us and to take the right decisions based on his desire and will for us. Now, this aspect of taking decision is part of life. In the corporate world, uh, this is called uh, decision sciences. The subject called decision sciences, the science of taking decisions. Now, I know a person who was um, a very, very uh, accomplished person. Uh, he was the professor of uh, business administration, Harvard Business School, Harvard University. His special subject was decision sciences. And uh, he was a consultant to many companies. And the, all these companies who took his consultancy uh, did very well in, uh, in the profits because he taught them how to take decisions. The science of taking decisions. So it's part of uh, operational research and management. And normally in the corporate world, there's something called management information systems. Nowadays, it, IT, there's so much information available. They're all uh, information fed to the, uh, the uh, corporate head who takes decisions. His job is to take right decisions. And uh, this subject is very, very popular subject. And Harvard University is uh, one of the top universities in the whole world on management. And this person whom I knew very well was a professor of business administration in the Harvard Business School. And his subject was decision sciences. And very, very effective in the corporate world. But sometimes in personal life, he took wrong decisions because he did not depend upon the Lord. You and me are so blessed today. We are God's children. We can listen to his voice because we are sheep. In John 10, 27, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice and God never makes mistakes. He is perfection personified. 1 John 1, 5, God is light in him. There is no darkness. And Jesus says in John 8, 12, I am the light of this world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light of life means you, you walk in a path where everything is lit, lit up, illuminated, and you are in the center of God's will, and you will learn how to take the right decisions. Very important subject this is. Very rarely it is taught in the in churches, because we all take decisions. And how I take decisions, or basically taking decisions. And therefore, it's important for us to know that uh, the Lord will guide us in every aspect of our lives. He's concerned about every aspect of our life, not just spiritual life. Home life, social life, official life, uh, uh, professional life. Everywhere he has to be a Lord of our lives. And therefore, the key to this is to take the right decisions, is to listen to God and be led by the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, you know, the deep things of God. And we have been given His Spirit to be in us, who lead us the way we have to go. 1 John 2, 27 says, the anointing will teach us all things. Holy Spirit anointing will teach us all things, and it will give us the instruction, the rhema, to take the right godly decision, every aspect of our lives. And therefore, we must know how to take decisions based on the instructions of God, led by the Spirit. Romans 8.14 says, 
as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now, before we learn to take decisions based on specific matters concerning your personal life or official life, whatever it is, we must be right with God to take the right decisions. Before we try to find out the specific will of God in areas of our life where we have taken decisions, be it a job offer, be it a marriage proposal, any decision to know the will of God. People say, I want to know the will of God, I want to do the will of God. Before we try to find out the specific will of God for any particular matter, we must be busy doing the general will of God. General will. Be busy doing that. When in the center of God's will, the general will, we can discern God's specific will. Now, in the corporate world, uh, there's always saying, even the secular world also, the saying is, don't take decisions when you're emotional. Don't take decisions when your mind is not clear. That's what, that's what teaching in the world today. Don't take emotional decisions from the heart. Don't take emotion, mental decisions when your mind is in trouble. And you must be uh, at the right frame of mind and right heart to take right decisions. For us as Christians, it's different. In a way, similar, but more than that. It is, don't take decisions when not in the center of God's will. Be in the center of God's will in terms of the general will of God. Walking in His ways, obeying Him, having fellowship with Him, living by the Word, living by the Spirit, and let the peace of God in your heart be there in general terms. And when you find, want to find out the specific will in terms of taking decisions, then it's easy for us. And the key is to be always intimate with God. Not only when we have a problem, we go to God. All the time, we should have fellowship with God. And He will really reveal to us what is the right, right decision. Now, in Psalm 32, 8 and 9, the Lord says, I will instruct you and teach you the way you have to go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding but must be controlled by bitter and bridle or they will not come to you. In the corporate world or the secular world, this is called decision sciences or decision, art of taking decisions. I don't know the art or science. Decision taking is art or the science, I don't know. But as far as we are concerned, is listening to God's spirit, being led by the spirit to, to take the right decisions. So first of all, we have to be people who are having fellowship with God in general terms as a way of life, and to draw closer and closer to God. When you're intimate with God, knowing His will in particular situations is very, very simple to understand. Because God says, I will instruct you, I will teach you, I will counsel you and watch over you. And as a caution, the next verse, don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. To make a mule go to the, uh, the handler or a owner, he has to put a bit of bridle. And God said, don't be like that. Always have fellowship with me. In fact, we're called to be a people who pray in the Spirit at all times. Ephesians 6, 18. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, God, who called us into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, is faithful. In all aspects of our lives, including to teach us the way we have to go. When you have fellowship with him and you seek his counsel in a particular matter, he won't say, come tomorrow, come day after tomorrow, I'll tell you. Then and there he will tell you. When you're intimate with God, we can take decisions, right decisions, on a moment by moment basis. One of the measures of intimacy with God is clarity in taking decisions. We are going to be a people who have a clear mind. In 1 Peter 4, 7, Peter writes, Be clear-minded and self-controlled that you can pray. Be clear-minded and self-controlled that you can pray. And you pray to find out the will of God, all the more you must be clear-minded. No cluttering the mind with all kinds of thought processes. And we depend upon the Holy Spirit, we will realize 
as it's mentioned in uh, uh, Second Timothy one seven, God did not give the spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and sound mind. Sound mind. They are called to have a sound mind and a clear mind to take decisions based on what we uh, analyze a particular situation and wait upon God to speak to hearts and minds. He speaks to heart and mind. That's why we are called to be a people whose hearts and minds are in the things of God. In Colossians chapter 3, 1, 2, and 3, Paul writes, Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. But Christ said to the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died in life is no hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is the life, appears, you'll appear with them in glory. So heart and mind should be tuned to God's spirit. Heart and mind can be in conflict many times. Also, when it comes to taking decisions, heart says one thing, mind says something else. Mind analyzes, heart is inclined to respond emotionally. Let me give a practical example. I'm, I wonder how many of you are following the World Cup cricket which is going on. If someone asked a New Zealander, who will win the semi-finals? You know what he will say? My heart says New Zealand, mind says India. My heart says New Zealand, because he's a New Zealander. He wants his country to win. Heart says uh, New Zealand, mind says India, because India has won all the nine matches. So intellectually, in India will win, but emotionally, New Zealand will win for a New Zealander. For Indian, emotionally and mentally, India. Heart is for India, mind is for India. So heart and mind are in conflict. I mean, practical example. When it comes to the things of God, in life itself, he'll speak to hearts and minds. So fundamental requirement is we are constantly in constantly in fellowship with God. Having fellowship with the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul writes, Now by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. We are called to be people forever more to the end of our lives. Even after we go to heaven, we'll have fellowship with the Lord. While living in this world, we have constant fellowship with the Holy Spirit, who is a counselor. He'll teach us what is best for us. In the Old Testament time, in Isaiah 48 chapter, 17, 18, the Lord says, uh, Isaiah writes, this is what the Lord says, you're the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord who teaches you what is best for you. What is best for you. Who directs you the way you have to go. If only you pay attention to my commandments. Your peace would have been like a river. Righteousness like the waves of the sea. I am your God who teaches you what is best for you. And suppose you take decisions. You are at uh, you know, confusion. Then we have to go back to him only to understand clarity. And God, I will teach you what is best for you. Who will direct you where you have to go. And then he goes on to lament over these people. If only you pay attention to the commandments, your peace would have been like a river. Right as like the waves of the sea. What God is saying here is, I am your God who wants the best for you. Who will teach you what is best for you. But then to know my will for you, to take the right decisions, not wrong decisions, you must have my peace. To have my peace, you must walk in my ways. General walk with me, you should have. You're not walking with me, you're not obeying me. There's no peace. So how can you find what is best for you? You can't find what is best for you. Because you're unable to understand because you're not having peace. You're not walking with me. So fundamental requirement is every one of us must draw closer and closer to God. In James chapter 4, 7 and 8, we read, James writes, Submit yourself then to God. This is the devil, he will flee from you. Submit to God. This is the devil, he will flee from you. Come close to God. God will come close to you. He will try to influence us to various people. All kinds of voices we hear. But then he is, submit to God. This is the devil, he will flee from us. He will run away from us. 
We resist the, law, the, the devil by drawing closer and closer to God. First of all, walk in his ways, listen to his voice and realize he knows much better than we know. Sometimes Christians, they try to lecture to God. They tell God what God has to do. Sometimes what happens, you know, we tell God our, our will and say, this must happen. For example, uh, take uh, general elections. Uh, when they pray, we pray for a particular person to win, you can vote for whomever you want, no problem. But don't tell God whom he has to put. The book of Romans 13 chapter, the first few verses say, that there's no authority except that instituted by God. There's no authority except that instituted by God. What authority there is, is instituted by God. God will put his right, his person, the right or wrong, we don't know. He knows best, no? Sometimes God puts someone above us in, in, in uh, government uh, positions, governing positions, that we may depend more on God, not a person convenient for us. When Paul wrote to the Romans and said, be submit to authority, be subject to authority, who is losing, lo uh, ruling Rome? Nero, a tyrant, terrible man he was from a worldly point of view. But God put him there and, and Paul said to the Romans, be submit to authority. Submit to authority. There's no authority except that instituted by God. That's why I don't pray for elections. I don't tell God who should come to power. Whoever comes to power, I pray for them. Because as Christians, we are not, we are not God's political advisors. We are not God's political advisors. He knows best. So the thing you don't pray for. You pray for peaceful elections. You pray for uh, God's will to take place. Yes, but don't tell God what he has to do. An example I'll give you. Imagine soccer World Cup final. Brazil and Argentina. Brazilian team has their own chaplains who pray for Brazil to win. And Argentina plays has their own chaplain. They have chaplains. Every uh, team has got a, a pastor, chaplain, who prays for Argentina win the World Cup. So imagine the two teams are playing World Cup final for soccer. And uh, the Argentine pastor praying for Argentina to win, Brazil, Brazil to win. Whom will God give the World Cup to? Don't pray about these things. Then take olden days, Anglo-French wars. Very, those are very common. They are always fighting. The Britishers and the France, the French are fighting those days in the 16th, 17th century. And what happens? The army has chaplains. Every army has chaplains. The British pastor pray for England to kill the French soldiers. French pastor pray for French to kill the, the British soldiers. Imagine what God is going to do. He's only watching, lamenting over his people that they fight over all these things. So, it's important to understand God's will is perfect. Don't advise God what he has to do. Listen to God and act upon what he wants you to do. We often you lecture to God. There are people who give sermons in prayer. Sermons to God. To be heard by people also. Let's not be foolish. We are servants. He is the master. Let's listen to him. So have fellowship with them, intimate fellowship with them. And as you walk in the ways of God, we can discern his guidance to take right decisions. In the corporate world, they say that uh, uh, some decision is better than no decision. Some decision is better than no decision. There are some people who are very indecisive. They can't take decisions. Everywhere, even life, we find them everywhere. They can't take decisions. They're scared of the decisions. They, they fear failure. They fear failure. If I take a wrong decision, I'll suffer. Actually, you know what? A wrong decision better than no decision. Because wrong decision means you learn from it. Make a mistake, you learn from it. And therefore, we don't go about aimlessly. We go about listening to God's voice and he will never make mistakes. God never makes mistakes. Our mistake, we don't listen to God. We act on our own. But he's so gracious. Even if you make a mistake, he'll redeem. He'll redeem her. But don't make a mistake. When you depend on God, you'll not make a mistake. So first and foremost, first principle is always be close to God. Have fellowship with him. Be busy doing God's general will. or fellowship with him. Obedience to his word. Then we have the general peace of God. And when it comes to taking decisions, sometimes we are crossroads. We are confused. In the Old Testament time we read, in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, is written, stand at the crossroads and look. Stand at the crossroads. What are crossroads? 
For example, you come in a, come in a road, you come to a fork. Main road, that one, two, two uh, roads, uh, take a fork. Which way to go? Right or left? Which way do you have to go? We don't know. Cross the roads. So here it says, Jeremiah 6, uh, chapter, verse 16, send the cross to the look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask for the good ways and walk in it. You'll find rest for your souls. Rest for soul means peace of mind. So at crossroads, you go back to God's word. Ancient ways are the word of God. Word of God. God's word guides us the way we have to go. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet, light for my path. Lamp to my feet, light for my path. So God's word is a basis for us to discern his will. His instruction, his rhema. But God never speak against the spirit of his word. Also, he's given us the Holy Spirit, who is a counselor. Who will counsel us as they got the right decisions, God's decisions for us. God's will for us, his desire and tel telma for us. Counselor he is. It's called parakletos in John 14, 16. Parakletos means counselor, comforter, encourager. And he will take the scriptures and make it come alive to us. When are crossroads, go back to God's word and fellowship with God. There's no confusion with the Holy Spirit. In John 16, 13, Jesus says, the spirit of truth will lead you into all truth. The spirit of truth will lead you into all truth. There's no confusion. 1 John 2, 27, anointing will teach you all things. So as we learn to live by the spirit and the word and by faith, we'll be able to discern the specific will of God. Having said that, for everything in life, we don't seek God's uh, instruction. For example, uh, simple things in life, like get up in the morning, you probably have go and brush your teeth and then have coffee. Now you don't ask God, Lord, should I have coffee or should I eat newspaper? Or should I go to the drawing room or bedroom? Or dining room, where should I go? You don't ask God, what's your decision, Lord? We take decisions, no? We all take decisions. Without consulting God, we take decisions. Nothing wrong with that. Because in same Psalm 119, four verses later in verse 109, the psalmist says, Verse 105 says, your word, the lamp from my feet, light from my path. Verse 109, though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I'm taking decisions. I'm deciding for myself. Whether I should uh, you know, wear a blue shirt or green shirt. Do you ask God when you get up and go in the morning, Lord, what's your will for me, Lord? Should I wear a white shirt or should I have a blue shirt? Should I wear a red shirt? Do not ask God, no? You just go, take decisions. Nothing wrong. But while doing so, whatever decision you take in life, always have scripture as a basis, as a reference point. So the psalmist says, to a constant take my life in my hands, I'm deciding for myself, I will not forget your law. In other words, whenever I tend to go away from God's word, he will bring me back. So God's word guides us the way we have to go. He's a counselor, the Holy Spirit. So also, the word of God is a counselor. In Psalm 119, verse 24, the psalmist says, Your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. Your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. So God's word counsels us with regard to taking decisions, right decision. Holy Spirit gives us counsel to take the right decision. And they both work together. And for us to be fruitful in whatever we do, you take right decision, you will bear fruit in it, isn't it? Right decision. Whatever you do, take right decision, you will bear fruit. And for that to happen, you must have the wisdom of God to guide us. Wisdom of God. Wisdom will teach us how to respond to situations. Application of knowledge. Like for example, in Colossians, in chapter 1, from verse 9, Paul writes, since we heard about you, we must stop praying for you. Asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. Through spiritual wisdom and understanding. Wisdom given by the Holy Spirit and understanding given by the Holy Spirit. Understanding of what is best, what is right. Right decision, not wrong decision, not wavering. 
It goes on to say, and we pray this, that we live lives worthy of God, pleasing Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in His knowledge. Bearing fruit in every good work. We take right decisions based on the wisdom God gives you. We'll bear fruit in that. Take wrong decision, we'll mess up. The different thing is God will redeem the situation. But why mess up in the first place? Why not depend upon the Spirit of God to give us wisdom and understanding? Also, that wisdom will give us peace to discern God's will. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, Paul writes, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The members of one body been called to peace and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The word rule is from a Greek word called brabio. And brabo means to decide. To decide. To decide between good and good. Good and bad, very easy to decide. Anybody can decide good and bad. You know what is bad, what is good, you choose good. If you're um, uh, basically, you want to obey God. Good and good, how do you decide? How do you take decisions based on which is best? Only one is best. Fighting things are good. Only one is best. How will you know? By the peace of Christ, you will decide. Rabio, to decide, to arbiter. So when we live by the Spirit and the Word, and then ask God for his wisdom, ask God for the peace in that matter, and then what happens is, when you walk closely with God, his will and our desire will develop a unique oneness. As happened to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. When he was in, there was, uh, in Susa, he was one of the exiles in, uh, in Susa. When he was in Susa, he heard Nehemiah that the walls are broken down, walls are broken down, gates are burnt. And then, he has a burden to go to Jerusalem and build the wall. He had a spontaneous burden to go to Jerusalem and build the wall because they've been broken down. But he paid for three months. And then he realized that that desire to go to Jerusalem was a planting of the Lord. Jeremiah 2.12, he, he writes there, I have not told anyone what the Lord had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. What the Lord had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. To go and build the wall was a planting of the Lord. So when you walk with God closely, knowing the will of God, taking the right decision, is second nature. It's incidental. It's by default. So I come back to the bottom line, like a boomerang man coming back, intimacy with God. Be always close to God. Don't just go to him when you have a problem. Always be right with him. And then you'll be able to take right decisions. Now, we all know that God's plans for us are the best plans. And in Jeremiah 29 and 11, promise for us also, he writes, uh, God, through Jeremiah, God speaks, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Praise God. He has the best plans. But unfortunately, it's possible for us, if we're unwise people, to make our own plans against God's plans. He has the best plans. You must listen to him. Don't advise him. Don't order God around. Don't dictate to him. Listen to him. Because while he had the best plans, we can make our own plans against the will of God. How do you know that man can make plans against God's will? In the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, from verse 1 we read, God tells his people, what are those who make plans? Woe to those who make plans that are not mine. Form an alliance, but not by my spirit. Form an alliance, but not by my spirit. They make their own ideas, not led by the spirit. So it's very important for us to understand, we must constantly depend upon the Holy Spirit. Don't make your own plans. Even though God has the will for you, the best plans for you, He'll teach you that. Right decisions can make wrong decision. You depend upon your own intellect. Let me give an example from the Old Testament. The king called Asa, a very godly king, one of the few godly kings in Israel, in, in Judah actually. Very often I share this with you. After Solomon, there are 20 kings in Israel, 20 kings in Judah. And there was also a lady who was a queen for some time. 
for a few months, a few years. Out of 40 kings, only eight were godly kings after Solomon. The first among them was Asa. And the story is found in the book of 2 Chronicles, three chapters, 14, 15, 16. Later on, you can read it. If you can't read all the three chapters, I'll take some uh, experts, uh, excerpts from that. He was a godly king. If you look at uh, 2 Chronicles 14 chapter, verse 2 says, he was good and right before God. Good king, right before God. The first after Solomon who were right before God. Out of 40 kings, eight only were godly. One of first among them was Asa. Now Asa, for the first 10 years of his life, of his reign, there were no wars. No wars, 10 years. There were no wars. There was a time of restoration, uh, 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 both uh, economically, militarily, Socially, there was the renovation, restoration of the land. He threw all the Ashara poles, all the high places of the pagans. He threw away, he, he destroyed everything. He's pleasing to God, Asa, King Asa. Then what happens? It says in the book of uh, 15, chapter of uh, uh, Second Chronicles, that uh, ninth verse onwards, that Zerah the Kushite came with a vast army. By the way, he had an army of what uh, eight verse says, 14 chapter was eight, verse eight says. That he had an army of uh, uh, 300,000 uh, soldiers in Judah. Uh, and they had the large shields and they had spears. And they had 280,000 from Benjamin, small shields and bows, bow and arrows. 380,000 soldiers. Then the Kushar came to attack Jerusalem. And uh, Asa being a king, godly king, cried out to God. He prayed to God, Lord, there's no one like you to help the uh, helpless against the uh, vast, uh, against the army, against the, uh, those who are strong. Those helpless against the strong, there's no one like you to help. We rely on you, Lord. We, we, we rely on you and Lord, help us. And praise God, God fought the war for them and the, the red uh, Kushat army was destroyed. And because Asa depend upon God, there's no one like you, Lord, to help this uh, powerless against the mighty. A vast army came against uh, these people in, in Judah. And God himself won the war for them. Then it says in the Bible that uh, Azariah, uh, 15th chapter of uh, Second Chronicles, Azariah, who was a prophet, came and told Asa, encouraged him. When you depend upon God, when you cry out to God, you seek him, he will be, he'll be found by you. Don't neglect him, don't leave him alone. He encouraged him, you depend upon God, and God answered your prayer. Praise God. So God confirmed to Asa, through this Azariah, the prophet, he did the right thing before God. Depend upon God, and he won the war. Now, the Bible says in the 19th verse of 15th chapter of Second Chronicles, for 25 years later on, there was no war. Nothing happened. 35th, uh, 35th years of the reign, nothing happened. 25 years, there was peace and harmony. There was a restoration. When nothing happens, people can get complacent. He got complacent. He forgot what God did. Will depend upon God. Then what happened? Basha, king of Israel, came to attack Judah. Israel and Judah those days. Basha, king of Israel, came to attack Judah. And Asa, being worldly wise, he made a, uh, the king of Aram, Ben Hadad, king of Aram, made a treaty with him. Told him, you break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, come and help me. And that plan worked. The plan worked. He made a treaty with Ben Hadad to thwart the enemy uh, uh, from uh, uh, King Israel, Basha. And very beautiful strategy. He was the mind, not dependent upon God this time. And he was successful. Successful. He used his mind to make a treaty against the will of God. Then the prophet Hanani comes and rebooks Asa. He says, why did you depend upon the king of Aram? What about God? When the Libyans and the Kushites came to attack you, this happened 25 years back. 36 years of reign, this thing happened. When uh, uh, he met Riti with Basha, king of Israel, uh, sorry, Ben Hadad to thwart Basha, king of Israel. 25 years, nothing happened. He forgot what God did. And then he makes a beautiful plan. I'll make a treaty with Ben, ben Hadad and thwart the enemy. It was successful. And Hanani came and rebooked. Asa for doing this. He said, don't you only remember that when the vast army came and you read upon God and God when you, why have we gone to this man? When King of Aram, why do you make a treaty with him? 
And he says something fascinating. Second Chronicles 16, 9. I, the Lord, reigns over the earth to strengthen those hearts of fully committed to him. You've done a foolish thing. He tells us, you've done a foolish thing. God is searching for people who he wants to strengthen. And he sent to those hearts are committed. And by the way, we look at Second Chronicles 15, chapter 17. That Asa's heart was fully committed to God all the days of his life. His heart was committed fully. Asa, all the days of his life. Because how committed he could get strength from God. That's what uh, Anani tells uh, King Asa. You've done a foolish thing. The heart is committed. You get strength from God. Why do you go to Ben Hadad, king of Aram? And then what happens? Asa gets angry with this prophet. Puts him in prison. Unfortunately, later on we find, 39th verse of 2nd Chronicles 16 chapter, that he had a disease in his foot. It didn't depend on God. It depend upon the physicians. And two years later he died. And it was very sad. But then look at this. He, was, he had, he experienced God's grace. Heart was for God. Mind is on making his own plans. Against the will of God and God rebuked him for that. So our heart and mind must be on things of God all the days of our life. And you take right decision, not God, uh, ungod decision. Earlier when Kushat Zara came and attacked him, he prayed, looked to God and prayed. God honored that desire of his, depending on God. Then when Basha came, Zara came to attack, he used his earthly thinking, worldly wisdom to thwart the enemy. It worked also. It displeased God. So our heart and mind both upon God. We'll be consistent in our walk with God. We won't waver through unbelief. Unfortunately, we can make plans against the will of God. And some people make plans and tell God the plans. Mm -hmm. So listening to God, God, I made this plan. Uh, please, you honor that Lord. As someone said uh, many years back, I remember in a meeting, that uh, people who do not uh, respond to the gospel don't want to go God's way. They go their own way. They have their own way of going, trying to find God. They don't want to go God's way. God's way is Jesus. They want to go their own way. They be blame the people of other faiths who don't respond to the gospel. What about Christians? We are not very different. We go our own way and think it's God's way. We go our own way. We are consulting God. We take wrong decisions. When you walk intimately with God, we'll make the right decision on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. There's no confusion with the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, we hear every Sunday in most churches this benediction. Second Corinthians 13, chapter 14. I'll repeat that. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. He's a counselor. He leads us what is the way we have to go, the best for us. And you always listen to him. Believe me, you'll never make mistakes. Of course, many of us make mistakes. We don't depend upon spirit. I made mistakes many, many times. But God brings us back. He will never condemn us. How nice it will be if you, before we take a decision, we consult him. Don't take decisions on your own. Wait upon the Lord. Till he speaks, you wait. Once he speaks, we act. There are times to pray and seek his counsel. Time, there are times to act. When it's time to seek his counsel, please don't act. When it's time to act, please don't pray. A very well-known man of God, whom I admired very much, but he also made some statements which are not uh, biblically correct. He once made a statement which is quoted by so many of uh, his people who uh, belong to his ministry. Attempt something so great for God that's bound to fail unless God is in it. Let me repeat that. Attempt something so great for God that is bound to fail unless God be in it. Makes a lot of logical sense. But is that biblical? I would say, don't attempt anything for God unless God is in it. Don't attempt anything for God unless God is in it. Before you act, pray. Seek his counsel. Wait upon God. Once he speaks, we act immediately. Now go try different methods. Attempt something so great for God is bound to fail unless God is in it. How, why should you act uh, Act till God speaks? It's like, you know, crossroads. Imagine you're coming to cross there are five roads. Go to find which is the way to the railway station. You won't try every road, no? 
one road try no just not the way. Come back. The cost so again next road. We'll ask someone which way. And this is the way you have to go. You spare so much of time and effort. Same before you act. Ask God's counsel. And once he speaks, go ahead in full steam, with zeal, with enthusiasm, with wisdom and with love. And we'll bear fruit in our lives. When you're intimate with God, we become friends of God. When you're friends of God, he will reveal the right decisions in every aspect of our life. Corporate world, like uh, this person I told you about, whom I knew very well, very close to me, all my from childhood, Harvard Business School professor, professor of decision sciences, are concerned with so many companies. Corporate world, that's all. What about other, other aspects of life? They don't know. Whereas God's spirit will lead us. Corporate world, your personal life, your um, um, uh, 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 church life, social, everywhere. Because he is concerned about every aspect of our lives. May all of us pray for God's counsel, Holy Spirit's counsel to take right decisions. There's no confusion with the Holy Spirit. Some people say, no, I'm very confused. I don't know what to do. The theme verse for today's meeting was Matthew 5.37. Yes is yes, no is no. There's nothing like I don't know. Yes is yes, no is no. Let me see. No, not like that. With God, everything is very clear. Black and white. No gray areas. The context of the particular verse is when in, in some of the Mount, he tells people, uh, it was heard, he said, don't make an oath and not keep it. When you make an oath, keep it. Don't swear either by heaven, which is God's throne, or earth, which is footstool, or by uh, Jerusalem, by the holy city. Let it yes be yes, no be no. Don't swear by your head also. When you don't even know your hair, can't make it black or white. So don't swear. Yes is yes, no is no. How can you know yes or no? Wait upon the Lord, be led by the Spirit, and we'll be clear in our decisions and we'll bear fruit. Now, friend of God, listen to him. John 15, 15. What happens because of that? We'll bear fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold. Go back, fruit, fruit that will last. So now God gave us a very simple message today is decision making, right decision making, led by the Holy Spirit. We say no to certain things that God doesn't like. Yes to what God says to us. There's no in between, no gray area. Yes is yes, no is no. Praise God. Let us say yes to God and no to the devil. God bless you all. And let me pray for you, for God's wisdom upon you to take right decisions. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of Lord being able to listen to your voice, Lord, to walk with you, Lord, and be right, take right decisions, Lord. No confusion for us, Lord, because Lord, the anointing will teach us all things, Lord. I come to every one of us in your hands. So many areas of, our, of the lives, Lord, they have confusion, Lord. In marriage proposals, job offers, friends, what to respond to friends, Lord, every area, Lord, you give us wisdom, Lord. May wisdom be upon each one of your children, Lord. Anoint them with the Holy Spirit, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Let your power be upon them. Wisdom and power, Lord. Lord, to walk in your ways, to always be right with you, Lord, and be a blessing as you bless them, Lord. Thank you, Father. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.